It is Wednesday afternoon. It is July 26th. We are going to be picking up in Bereshit, Genesis 24. That date is very symbolic and important to me, and at some point I will divulge the reason. But right now we want to get back into our study. We've been on chapter 24 a couple of weeks. We're just about really through with the verse by verse. We're going to uh, just glance over from maybe about 50 on. I'm not going to read each and every verse till we get down to about 62, but I'll just refresh our minds. <clears throat> But this has been a beautiful chapter. It's a chapter when Abraham, the father, sent out the unnamed servant. We presume it to be Eliezer, but it was, he purposely was unnamed in this chapter to go and get a bride for his son. We saw last week that the servant is a picture of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, who does not speak of himself, but comes to reveal the, the son and the father to us through his spirit. The three in one, there's no jealousy. You can't be jealous of yourself. You are yourself. And, and mm -hmm. in some way, God the Father is God the Son, is God the Holy Spirit. The three that can show us in three different personalities, but yet are one. And so in that working together, we see the Father, the Son, and the Ruch Kodesh in this chapter. And we've only yet begun to see all the symbolism here and what's called typology in Scripture. But the servant has gone to get a bride. We know that, that the servant put out a fleece to know that he would pick the right bride. Here are our last two videos to know what that's all about because I won't go into detail now. I want to make sure we move forward. But he gets it right. It's like the horse right out of the gate. Boom, he wins. He gets on the first try exactly what he asked for. He, the, it, she proved to be who he asked for in her characteristics, which were important because she's going to come into the promised seed line. She's going to be the mother over those who will eventually lead to Messiah. The spiritual training has to be there. That's why the servant was sent to Abraham's <coughs> family not to take a wife from the Canaanites, the Canaanites that were around them. And she proved to be right in that way. She proved to be right in the family line. Everything came together. The servant's so excited. He does business, uh, uh, letting her know that she's being asked, basically her hand in marriage is being asked, and, and he wants her to go with him to meet the bridegroom whom she has never seen. You can begin to see what I'm beginning to draw your picture up because it's what we see here in scripture. I'll spell it out as we go on though. Um, Rebecca, Rivka in Hebrew, agrees. She leaves, and in verse 58, she was willing to leave immediately. Uh, the servant had maybe it had gone, we Googled, it, or Roger Googled, and it said that it was about a month traveling probably at, in that day to go the mileage that he had to go to go back to Abraham's family to pick that bride. And so a month there, a month to come home. That would be about the minimum amount of time, I guess, that Abraham and his son could be expecting a return because they didn't know how long it would take him there. I'm sure that in their wildest dreams, they weren't thinking that the servant would get an answer in the first hour he arrived and everything would be set so fast. But they were hoping and anticipating, or at least one was, and I'll explain that when we get to it in the scripture. You'll see what I'm talking about. But when Rivka was asked, if she would not wait a period of time but go the very next morning, she said in verse 58, I will go. And that was a picture of us, <coughs> that we should be ready to step out to go meet our bridegroom at any given moment in time, not allowing anything to hold us back. She didn't go alone. Her nurse, which would be like her nanny, went with her. She had other maidens that went with her. It shows the family was of wealth, the same as Abraham is, is of wealth and has promised her wealth. The family could be assured from the gifts given that she would be well taken care of, but that's you know about the extent of what they knew. They give her the blessing in verse 60 that, that, that you know, may there be a myriad of people that come from her, that would be her progeny, and may they possess the gate of their enemies. That means rule over the enemies. They were, they were asking God to bless her physically with children. That's huge in, in the Jewish perspective, even before I can say the word Jewish because they weren't Jewish yet, but, you know, in that line and looking toward the Messiah coming, this is critical that, that uh, that line carry on, but we also see that that physically, um, I mean, not just the physical blessing of children, but they wanted her blessed to, to not have, you know, a, a rough life, a hard time. So, a sweet, um, sending off, verse 
61 tells us that the servant took Rebekah. And I think I brought out last week that that was a picture of the bride, um, I'm sorry, the, the servant bringing the bride to meet the son. And we looked at 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, where there's something holding back the tide of evil here, that when that's released from here, then we know tribulation time comes, and we know that what's holding back, and we looked at it a little bit, we'll look at it more today, it, according to other scriptures that we've put together, is the Holy Spirit holding back that tide of evil. What's going to cause the Holy Spirit to leave in that way is the rapture, taking believers home to be with the Lord, so in essence to meet the bridegroom before that coming day of tribulation on this earth. As the servant is bringing her to meet her bridegroom, accompanying her on that long journey, he's teaching her all about the son on the way. And we know that that's what Yeshua said, when I go to heaven, the spirit would come and he'll teach you all things that I've spoken to you. He'd bring it back to their remembrance. He'd help them understand, even as we know the Ruch HaKodesh Holy Spirit helps us understand the scriptures this very day. When we dig into the Word of God, we know it's the Holy Spirit that illuminates our mind. So in the same way, we just see a dual role of the Holy Spirit by this servant. And by the way, we also said to us that this is another indicator, not exclusive by any means, but another indicator that yes, we do go before the tribulation because of the picture that's that was drawn here in typology that will keep developing. So looking at verse 62, we have that what Yitzhak has been doing. Uh, we have in 61, R Rivka with her female attendants, they had mounted the camels. They're riding in a camel caravan and they're following the servant, okay? And, and that's when it says the servant took Rebecca and departed, meaning departed from her family's home and headed back to the promised land, the land of Canaan, Canaan, where Abraham and Yitzhak are. So what happens? We don't have to get a long, drawn-out story what happened on the way, other than we know that the servant is telling her about uh, her beloved, or the one who will become her beloved, because we read, in, well, we'll read that in a few moments. In verse 62, now Isaac, Yitzhak, had come back from a journey to Bir Lahoi Roy, for he was living in the Negev. Okay, um, we'll look at, especially at the names of the wells that we've talked about in the past and in the future when we get into, I think it's chapter 26, is coming soon. But let me just remind you, that Bir Lahoi Roy is like the, the way of the well or the sing of the living of the way of the well. There's a little bit of difference in the Hebrew. Um, Lahoi Roy alone is the living one who sees me. Okay, so we're seeing uh, by the name that they're claiming God is seeing them, the Lord is seeing them, the Lord is seeing to them, and that sort of thing is in it. But again, we'll hit on more of this meaning in it just a bit, and especially we'll flash back on it when we get to chapter 26. But let me tell you that Yitzhak is associated with seven wells in his lifetime. Very interesting, because we don't read about anybody else with this many wells. We do read another interesting story of Yeshua with a woman at the well in, in Yochanan and John chapter 4. But um, in, with Isaac, in chapter 16 and verse 14, we have the living one who sees me. We have Lahoi Roy. We have that well. We have the here, beer Lahoi Roy here in 2511. We have Abraham's well in 26 and verse 18. These are in your cross references, by the way. We have the well called Esek in 26 verses 19 and 20. In verse 21 is the well Sitna. In 22 is Rehoboth. And then in chapter 26 verses 25 and, 20, and 33 is Sheba. And again, as we come to each, I'll give you meaning, the Hebrew meaning of the words. But right now, I think the point more to that, to see um, Yitzhak so involved with wells in his life, and the point of the well um, even meets, or he doesn't, but the servant meets his beloved to be, his wife, at oh, the well. I think that what we're looking at is what the water is representing. And often in scripture, we see the water of life is a representation to us of Yeshua. 
It could also speak of the Holy Spirit who comes and reveals the, through, you know, like rivers of living water. But we do see Yeshua speak specifically about it. I'm not going to give you the whole Hebrew uh, lesson because it would take a whole class. But in Yochanan chapter 7, and we can look there, you know, briefly. I'm just like I say, I'm not going to do the uh, entire uh, teaching behind it. But this was a ceremony that was going on at the temple at the time called the White Water Libation Ceremony, which is so symbolic of Yeshua, of him as Savior, of him as Messiah. It's, it's fascinating to look at how many layers in Scripture. That when in, in Yochanan, in John chapter 7, verse 37 when it says now on the last day the great day of the feast that's how we know that this was the water libation ceremony this is hoshana rabbah is the name of it that yeshua stood up and as they're pouring out this water as they're dancing around as they're crying out hoshana save us and they're crying out save us bring us salvation now in the middle of all of that, and it would have been noisy. They're singing, they're dancing into the Lord. They're, they've got this whole ceremony that's followed the water coming up and being poured out. And, and it, it uses silver, it uses gold, speaking to redemption, speaking to deity, the whole thing, so symbolic. And by the way, someone even once said that you've never seen a joyous celebration unless you've seen this celebration. In their mind, this was the ultimate of all, out of all the holy days and all the excitement and dancing and all that goes on right in the middle of that Yeshua with a loud voice why <clears throat> because if he's going to be heard above the, the the noise level the I can't think of the word I want the tinder or whatever they call it um, he's going to have to be loud and he cries out and he uses the analogy right there if anyone is thirsty let him come to me and drink he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. 39 makes it clear to us, but he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Yeshua was not yet glorified. And we know that Yeshua even said if he didn't go back up into heaven in his ascension, that the Spirit wouldn't come. Why? I don't fully understand. I mean, that's just the way God ordained it. I'm sure there's more to it than that. May the Lord open my mind to know. I hear hints and ideas, but never anything I can say, wow, I bet that's it. Work wasn't done. But the point being... Hmm? Work wasn't done. The work wasn't, wasn't done. done. Yeah. Right, but, but why, you know, Yeshua was saying, it's almost as if I can't, he can't come if I don't go. Why? You know, it's... Uh, you know, it's not a weakness that, that heaven has to have two parts. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. You hear a lot of things, but just let your mind go. See what the Holy Spirit says to you on it, but don't miss the point that the the water, Yeshua was saying, come to me if you're thirsty. I'm the well of water. And he was saying that he's speaking of the Spirit who would come and living waters would continually flow from you when you have the Spirit within. So water is, is life. <coughs> We know it's life physically, but it's being drawn here as the well of our salvation, spiritual life. Yes? Now, which one were you thinking? Did you say they were celebrating? It's called Hoshana Rabbah, the great uh, day of salvation. It's the water libation ceremony, and it's in the middle of an eight day celebration. Um, Sukkot. Sukkot. Yes. And I can give you more later. Okay, thank you. Yes. I can point you to it. Another video taking. Okay, but, but that's not the, the 50 days of Passover. No, it, that's Shavuot, which means sounds close, and Shavuot was the coming of the Holy Spirit, but no, it was not on that day. This one is S U K K O T. Yes, one way to spell it. Yes, there are several ways, but that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I'll be glad to point you, like I say, to other uh, teachings. Um, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I love it. Um, but going back here now to verse 63, just keep in mind that the well, you know, <coughs> Isaac so, um, his life so intertwined with the well, the well of salvation, the well representing Yeshua, the well representing the Ruch HaKodesh, both, um, which is no problem since the two are one, along with the Father. Okay, so Isaac's come back from his journey to that well. And by the way, it says for he was uh, living in the Negev. When we talk about Hebron, 
when we talk about where Pierre La Roy is, when we talk about these, they were not far from each other. They're all in southern Israel. I didn't think to put up a map, but they're all near Hebron or Hebron. So all, you know, in that area, desert area in the Negev. Negev, it means dry. The desert is dry down there. Trust me, it still is to this day. So Isaac had gone to the well for whatever reason. Maybe he took his flocks. Maybe he watered his flocks. Maybe he made sure everything's going well. You know, he was living in the Negev, so that's where he would go to get a good source of his water because he's not going to be getting it from rain. He's not going to turn on the kitchen faucet. <laughs> this is where he's going to go to get the water he needs for himself and his all that belongs to him. So what's he doing besides that? Verse 63 says, Yitzhak, Isaac, went out to meditate in the field. Now, it's very interesting in the Hebrew what that word meditate really means. It's already also been translated pray, so he was out praying. It's been translated wailing, lamenting, moaning. So the idea behind meditating in this is that in prayer, he's almost in agony. There's something on his heart, and he's just crying it out to God, moaning. It is something. This this is big. This is not, Lord, thank you for the nice day. Give me a good, you know, whatever. This is something that, that's heavy on his heart. It could be that he was still mourning the loss of his mother. Remember, that's one reason why Abraham sent for the servant to go get a bride. He saw the emptiness in his son's life. He, his mom probably was highly important to him. They probably shared so much in the emptiness of the days, the emptiness of not having a partner. Abraham knew the importance of having that partner, a spiritual partner, and one who would carry on in, you know, um, with the training of the next generation spiritually too. But Isaac himself had to have been moaning, mourning, praying, <coughs> intense, could have been saying, Lord, I'm so lonely. Could have been saying, you know, Lord, help the servant find someone for me. He, he probably was very open to that. We don't see anything that gives us any indication he wasn't. And when we realize that in our picture, Yitzhak is the son, now think about our son who is in heaven. And by the way, you know, Sarah has died three years earlier. We know that Yeshua had a three-year ministry, three and a half years in fits, you know. Then he does ascend into heaven. And what is he doing? Is he praying with that kind of intensity for us because he's interceding for us right now? Think about that. We often think of our side, our intensity in prayer, our moaning, our groaning, how we're feeling. What's the son's heart like? I think Yitzhak gives us a snapshot. He's really intense in his prayer with concern for his, his bride to be. So he's out there, he's meditating the field and it's toward evening. It's coming toward the time of darkness, toward sundown coming, the approach of the evening. Let me bring you some symbolism to us in scripture what this means. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. And we will look at verses 2 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 2 and 5. 1 Thessalonians 4 speaks of rapture verses. I'll point that out shortly. But um, chapter 5, verse 2 says, For you yourselves know full well the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is a name for the tribulation period. To the world it will come as a thief. It will be on them suddenly. They're not reading the warning signs that we're reading in Scripture. They may be reading the same thing in their newspaper, but they're not reading it with the, oh, God foretold this, I know what's coming. So you, you've got to think in their way. Those who are not in the light, they are suddenly going to find themselves in a, the midst of a catastrophe. There's no other way to put it. But look at the encouragement, verse 5. For you, now Paul's the author of Thessalonians, he sent this letter to the church, to the called out assembly, to the believers in Thessaloniki. So he's not talking to the world, he's talking to believers. So when he says, for 
you, he's talking to the believers of the, the called out assembly of Thessaloniki. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So when it says it comes on as a thief in the night, it does not come on to the sons of the day as a thief. It doesn't come on to the sons of light as a thief. They're not going to experience a sudden, oh no, here we are in tribulation days because we're of the light, not of the dark. We're not of the night. Yitzhak going out into the field, looking for his bride to come, is a picture for us of our son in heaven, coming out of heaven, looking for his bride to call his bride home. We've got a great picture of the rapture here. Yeshua comes out in the air to meet his bride in the air. That's one of the major points that show us the difference between rapture and second coming. First coming, he put his footprints down on Israel, on the Mount of Olives, on Jerusalem and Galilee, and you know he walked all over in the land. In rapture, his feet stay in the clouds. He does not come down to earth. Second coming, which follows first coming, he will come all the way down, put his feet on the Mount of Olives, it will cleave in two, and we go on with the end of the, the uh, War of Armageddon and the setting up of the kingdom. So it's very clear that there's a difference between rapture and second coming. Rapture is for his bride. Second coming is with his bride. Keep your for and keep your with separate and you'll know which scriptures you're looking at, whether he's talking to believers in rapture or whether he's talking to believers at the time of his second coming because people will get saved after the rapture. 144,000 of them turn out to be the best Jewish evangelists the world has ever known. They carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. Why? Because the Jews have been scattered to the ends of the earth and God has promised to take the, the gospel message to them and then he would return. So it all fits in perfect succession with it, but what a picture. So Isaac's out in the field. He's looking for his bride. Yeshua comes out of heaven and he's looking for his bride to come up. And who brings the bride to him? The spirit, the servant, who goes, who takes us out of this world to meet the Lord in the air in rapture? The Holy Spirit. Do you see the picture? I love it. I love it. And to me, it's very, very clear. Let me just, because I don't know who my audience is completely, let me hit real quickly back up to chapter 4. These are the rapture verses. There are other places that talk about rapture also. 1 Corinthians 15 does. Actually, the Thessalonians refer to it all over because you have to know the difference between the wrath of God and the saving of us prior to the wrath of God. If you're already saved and you're being saved from the wrath to come, then it can't be talking about your soul salvation. It has to be talking about the tribulation on the earth. And when you keep that in mind through the books of Thessalonians and both books, you'll see a whole different picture. Rapture is the constant in this. Second Thessalonians builds on this. Here's the verses, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, because I think it's important. We will read through them quickly. It starts out and says, But we do not want you to be uninformed. Now, uninformed brethren. It may, you may have, we do not want you to be ignorant. Ignorant, you don't know. We don't want you to be uninformed. You need to understand this. I love Dr. McGee. He says, watch where you put your comments. <laughs> We don't want you to be, and we don't want you to be ignorant. Okay, I'm saying it wrong. We don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. <laughs> He's not calling them ignorant. It's we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. We want you to know when it happened. Is the Thessalonians were finding themselves standing at the graveside of loved ones. Some of us have experienced the loss of loved ones very recently. You know that open heart pain. They're standing at the graveside and they're crying and they're thinking their loved ones are, are missing out. They're not understanding the full picture. So he says, those of you, we want you to understand about those who are asleep. Now, let me make it very clear. That's not relating to another religion that teaches soul sleep. Paul didn't say here for those of uh, uh, those who have their souls asleep. It was the euphemism of the day. Today we say they passed away. 
I'm going to personalize it so I don't pick on anybody, okay? My adopted sister Anne went home to heaven very recently. I had to talk to some people about it in dealing with business matters recently and to summarize it quickly and succinctly, I had to say when she passed away. Now, I didn't mean that she passed, she went by, I missed her. You know, it's the way we politely say she died. You know, we, we don't want to say she's dead. That's just too hard on us and it hurts us. Those of us who are believers, it's easier because we know they're really alive. But that's what Paul's doing, is using the euphemism of the day. They wouldn't say they passed away in Paul's day. They said they, they, went, they fell asleep or they are asleep. They looked at the grave as a, a body when it's asleep. And so they just used that picture. But he's not teaching soul sleep at all because he says very clearly in, um, oh my goodness, is that Philippians? To, yes, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, he couldn't say that if the soul was literally sleeping in that grave like this other religion tries to teach. Then it's not to be with the Lord. He'd have to say to be absent from your body is to sleep in the grave, to be awakened one day. That's not what he's saying. So back here he's saying, those who died ahead of you, don't grieve like the rest of the world. Don't grieve like you're never going to see them again. And I say hallelujah because that's my greatest joy. I know I will see Anna again. It's not over. I will see her. I will spend eternity with her. We can kick up gold dust together. And that's what I told her last words to her as, as she was going home to be at the Lord it, because her body was so compromised. And I said, you know, when I catch up with you, because you're taking cuts in line, <laughs> then we're go, we'll go running down the streets of heaven together. We'll kick up some gold dust together. And she got a big smile because she was still enough with me at the time I was saying it. She knew what I was saying. Um, this, this is our hope. I'm not grieving like those who are saying, I'll never see that loved one again. I'll never get to speak to them again. I'll never hear their voice again. I've heard of all these and more of people who are really grieving because they think it's over. And how sad that is. Paul's going to assure them now. Don't, don't take, you know, why, why should they believe Paul? Just because he said it? No, he's going to tell them why. For if we believe that Yeshua Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And again, here's another proof. Where is God? He's in heaven. So if God's going to bring your loved ones with him, where are they? They're in heaven with them. They're going to come back with him. Okay, This is the picture being drawn. God will bring them with him, all who have fallen asleep in Yeshua, in Jesus. That means they were saved at their moment of death, before they, they died is what I'm trying to say. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Not by the word of Paul, not by the word of Rochelle today, by the word of the Lord. That we who are alive, that's us right now, we're alive. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we will precede them who have fallen asleep. We're not getting to heaven first, folks. We got skunked. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, but that's the way I feel right now. I told my, my adopted sister and I told my blood brother, you guys are taking cats in line. <laughs> I don't like this. Okay. I lost my place. Okay. We don't precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Isaac out in the field, okay? The Lord's going to come out from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the one who is speaking loud for him, and with the trumpet, and I think it's the shofar of God, because that's the, what the trumpet is in Hebrew. He's going to blow that shofar, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, Rochelle, you told me they are alive, they're in heaven. Yes. That's where their spirit went immediately upon departure from their body, but that body is lying in the grave. And in some way, because God is a God of the, the, the creation of everything, he will reunite that body with that spirit. They'll be caught up in that moment together as we're being caught up. We're already body and soul together, and we all come together in a split. They can't even call it a split second. So fast, science can't measure it faster than the twinkle in the eye and we're all immediately changed. 
all of us now put on that immortality that goes on into eternity. The loved ones who have preceded us apparently have something temporary until they're reunited with their body. Why God is doing it this way, you ask him, but I think it's because we're still going to be who we are. We're just going to be the glorified who we are. So it throws out the theories of those who say, oh, we're all going to be 30 years of age because that's the age the Lord was. Really? Really? When did God carbon stamp? Oh, let me make all flowers look alike. Let me make all trees look alike. Let me make all the fishies alike. If you want to believe that, that's fine. I can't argue it from Scripture, but my personal opinion is God loves variety, and we're going to be all shapes and sizes and, and colors and everything because God created beauty. He made man in his image. He didn't say, I made white man. He didn't say, I made this nationality. He didn't say, I made man and not woman. He made us all in his image, and I believe we will be the glorified selves. We will... We won't be old, we won't be wrinkled, we won't be, you know, warts and all. We will have our glorified bodies, but we're still going to be, I think, who we are, and that's all the more proof for those who have had glimpses and have seen loved ones and still know who they are. And why would you know less in heaven than on earth? So everybody who wonders, will we know each other in heaven? Yes. And do you think that the Bible people like Abraham are wearing name tags? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I think we're going to know because we have the mind like Christ. So we're going to just know. We're going to see Rivka and Yitzhak know each other. I'll show you that in a moment when we get back there. But finishing this here, the Lord's descendant, he's called up the dead in Christ first. We are alive and remain, are caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And the best words, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Hallelujah. He doesn't say we get to stay for seven years. He doesn't say we get to stay for, you know, a, a period of time. He says forever. Yes, we're going to leave heaven. We're going to come back with him. We're going to set up and rule the kingdom on earth with him. And who knows what we're going to do for all of eternity. God, is, wow, if he created all this and thought of all of this for us to enjoy now, what is out there? What is waiting on? My mind can't think. I'm like the, the one who hasn't even seen a car trying to picture a rocket, <laughs> okay? God will show us in his timing, but it, I'll put it this way, it's literally out of this world. <laughs> so, you all get your tickets, excuse me, know you got your ticket, know that you're ready. Your ticket, of course, is your salvation by the blood of Yeshua and Jesus. Back in Genesis. Back in verse 63, Isaac's out in that field. It's toward evening time. He's raised his eyes. He's looked and behold, don't miss it, okay? He raised his eyes. He was looking. I think he was scanning the distance. Is there any hope? Is there a caravan coming? And he sees because it says when he lifted his eyes, Behold, I gotta I gotta quit losing my place. Uh, he looked and behold, and camels were coming. Remember, they had a camel caravan when they went. They took ten camels that Rebecca had to water. Showed who she was and character and strength and all of that and, and generosity, compassion, everything. Now they're coming back. You see the camels coming. Can you imagine if it's a big desert sea? They gotta be kicking up dust. You know, and he's seeing the dust, and he can see the big shape of the camel. He can't see the people yet, but he can see the shape of the camel. So he's, he sees that, and he is excited. And we're going to see that, but it, it tells us first just that he saw them. Then it flips and tells us what's going on. Rebecca, Rivka, raised her eyes. She lifted her eyes. She, again, was looking for his appearing. Are we, as the bride, looking for the appearing of our bridegroom? Titus 2.13 says that, that that's our glorious hope is to be looking for the, the, I'm sorry, that's our hope to be looking for the glorious appearing of his coming. Yeah, I'm looking for it, and I can't hardly wait. So she's looking, and when she saw Yitzhak, she saw him for the first time. She dismounted from the camel. She alighted, if you've got the old English. Hebrew says it, I love it. She leaped down. She jumped off in a hurry, and I've been on a camel. We're up there. <laughs> she jumped down in a hurry. It was eagerness, probably. 
It was also respect. She's going to show Yitzhak great respect. It, it, with the consideration for his importance, she's about to meet a very important person. Not just because he's going to be her husband, but that's his position. He's going to be taking over Abraham's entire, you know, um, everything he's got. What's the word I want? You know, he he's uh, he already told the servant to tell um, Rivka's family that Isaac will inherit. That's the word I want. Is inheriting everything. So he's a man of means. He's a man of importance. She is already showing respect to him. She's also showing eagerness, I think. I think she was excited because, as we read, she said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? Now, remember, they don't have cell phones. They didn't call ahead and say, get ready, here we come. We're an hour away, you know, we're 10 minutes away. But she had to have instinctively known he's looking, he's anticipating. The same way she's looking and she's hoping and she's anticipating also. But notice how she instinctively knew it was him. You know, maybe the servant had said that they were getting close to home. But remember where her home was? There was a whole, what do I call it, town, village, whatever. You know, there were people who would come to get the, the water from the well. That's why the servant had to know how am I going to find the right one. So even as they're getting close, it could be the people that live there. You know, it didn't have to be the one that she was betrothed to, but she instinctively seemed to know. We're looking for our bridegroom, and I fully believe we're going to instinctively know in that split second when we're seeing that we're going to realize who we're seeing. And I think that's what's happening here. I think because she must have really been attentive to everything the servant told her on the way. She had to ask, what's he like? What's his character like? What's he look like? You know, a young girl's going to ask questions about the one she's going to spend the rest of her life with. So she's eager to learn. If we really love our bridegroom before we see him, Aren't we anxious to learn about him? Don't you get excited when you get in the scripture and you read of his love, his compassion, his long suffering? When I read today earlier, he's interceding, he's pleading for me. He cares that much about me. Yeah, it gets me excited. And yes, I want to know him more. And I just think this is what's going on. They're both excited in their own capacities, uh, or their own positions, I'm sorry, not capacities. So, she took her veil and she covered herself. That's our next, oh, the servant answered her. I, let me jump back in and read it all to you. She had this man and she asked who the man was. The servant said, he is my master. Now notice how he's already calling Yitzhak his master. He also knows Abraham has passed it down to Yitzhak now. He's going to be the master. He's going to be the, the head of the household. So she, learning that, she took her veil and she covered herself. Now that was the custom for a betrothed woman. She was not to be uncovered. She was not to be seen in all her beauty until after the, the marriage was consummated. When we meet our bridegroom, we are covered. We're covered in his robe of righteousness. We don't come in our own appearance. We do come covered in the blood of Yeshua, wearing his robe of righteousness. So, she's coming to meet him, she's covered herself, she's being respectful, and verse 36 says, the servant told Yitzhak all the things that he had done. Can you imagine the conversation? I just imagine the servant coming back so excited. Guess what? You know, and this had to be the minimal amount of time that could have been anticipated, remember? But guess what? Yitzhak, you, you just got to know, I had made this prayer so that I know the right one. This is what I prayed. This is how she did. You know, she's lovely inside and outside. She's compassionate. She's sweet. She's this. She, he's starting to, to tell her, tell Yitzhak all of this. And, of course, Yitzhak is very excited about meeting his, his uh, bride. Now, I know Yeshua knows all about us. But don't you think he gets excited when we spend that time with him, getting to know him? Doesn't it make you 
more dear to somebody when you get to know them. You know, we have acquaintances, we have friends, we have beloveds. There's a difference. So I think, you know, we can apply it in that way. So the servants told him all, verse 67, was Yitzhak's response. Then Yitzhak, Isaac, brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. Now that tent had not had anybody for three years. It had been an empty home. Very sad, no wonder he was mourning. Yitzhak was 37 when his mama died. She died at 127, she gave birth at 90. So we know he was 37. And later we see it from scripture, I gave you the reference last week that he's 40 when he marries Rebecca. So there's a little bit of time in the, the getting of the bride, but obviously he didn't marry her that night. There would be time to put into order the formalities for a marriage ceremony to take place. Um, and this may have been done in Hebron, because in chapter 23 and verse 2, when Sarah died, Abraham was living in Hebron. So they may have planned a wedding in Hebron. They may not have. They may have planned a wedding down in near the well. We don't know. But the picture that we get when Yitzhak takes Rivka into the tent after that marriage has been, been the ceremony has been had, it's like us coming into the son's home. Because remember, the son is heir to it all now. He's, we're coming into the son's home. That's heaven for us. And that was Sarah's tent for Yitzhak. That's after we meet him in the air. So here's my question. What do you think Yitzhak was doing with his mama's tent when the servant went to get the bride? I think he was getting it ready. You think he was fixing it up? Oh, I want it to look good for her. I want to add this. I want to do that. We've got a carpenter making our homes for us. And they'll be fully ready the day that, that he calls us home to be with him. And he tells us, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Wow, do we not see it in this, this story here? And I love that he took Rivka and she became his wife. The marriage happens because we hear the horror stories of things happening in this earthly life, a jilted bride or a bridegroom. No way, not in God's plan, they are brought together. It <coughs> is consummated. Then they did uh, move to the to near the well, La Hoy Roy, in chapter 25, verse 11. We'll read that that they were uh, they moved south there. That would be south of Hebron. Uh, so it could be here, regardless of where they had the wedding. Here is where we see Isaac move. And what I can tell you, a picture would be a type of the Lord's return to earth. Okay, Isaac went south okay when Yeshua comes from heaven to earth he's coming from the north how'd you get that Rochelle <laughs> Isaiah 14 13 let's read it Where? Isaiah chapter 14 verse 13 our prophet is shot yes Yahoo Isaiah 14 and verse 13 remember who cares what Rochelle says when you go out of this class, you go out saying, Thus says the Lord. But what the Lord says is what matters. Chapter 13, uh, chapter 14, verse 13 of Isaiah. But you said in your heart, and this is God speaking to Satan when he was lifted up in pride and wanted to dethrone God and have his position. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. That apparently was where God had his throne, where God has his, the mountain of his assembly would be like the Temple Mount where everyone comes up to worship. It's in the north of heaven. Now, ask me where heaven is. I can point up and that to me is north, but then like someone will say, well, where's heaven tonight? <laughs> because we don't stay in this position. What about the ones sticking out at the equator? What about the ones down under? 
we don't know in relation to that. What we do know is heaven is more grand than we can understand. But there is a northern point of heaven. Just as God's given north, south, east, and west to this earth, there is a north of heaven. And he said that's where he was seated. And Satan said, I want that place. He wasn't content with what he had. And he had the whole kingdom of earth for himself and his his uh, followers. It sad 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 what pride will do. But if if Yeshua is in the north, then the only way he can come is south. Even if he went east and west, because it'll be seen east and west, but he's still moving in a southerly direction. So when Isaac moves south, it could be a picture of the Lord coming from heaven in the north to for us. We are just as loved because in Genesis 24 and um, the, the verse we're in, verse 67, verse, here we go, sorry, my tablet doesn't hold it for me. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so Isaac took Rebecca, she became his wife, and he loved her. She was not just uh, there to be his servant, she wasn't there to be his um uh, to, you know, give him children. She was there because he loved her. He took her in and loved her like a wife. In Ephesians 5.25, let's read that and see what kind of love our bridegroom has for us. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. In this area, it, it is Paul speaking to the called out assembly, what we call today the church. And in chapter 5 and verse 25 of Ephesians, we read, Husbands, love your wives, just as Messiah also loved the church. How did he love her? He gave himself up for her. No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for another. When it says that Messiah loved, loves his, his called out assembly, his church, his bride, so much he was willing to die for her. That's the example he gives to the husbands, that that's how they're to love their wives. And I'll tell you, if a husband loves his wife with that kind of love, they have a wonderful marriage. There's no problem with, with quote, submission, etc., because it all falls in place when that kind of love is there. So, Isaac genuinely loved her. She loved him. She's coming to fulfill that void. She's come to be his companion. Um, when it says in the end of our chapter, he was comforted after his mother's death. That Hebrew word means to give strength or staying power. When we read it in Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 4, it says that the idol builder is said to comfort his idol with nails and hammers. Now obviously an idol builder wasn't taking the idol and let me comfort you, I know you're hurt, you know, let me soothe your boo-boos, you know, no. But the, he was making that idol stronger by adding nails to it, hammering it, making it something strong that they were going to bow down sadly and worship. But the idea, again, is giving you this, adding strength to it, helping it, staying power. And that's what Rivka would bring to Yitzhak. She would encourage him. She would strengthen him. She would help him stay the course. She would be giving her strength to him. All the way back we see it with when God gave Eve to Adam. He gave her to be his completer. Together the two would make one. It wasn't that one was to lord it over the other. It wasn't a superior and an inferior. It wasn't a first thought and an afterthought or anything else. He didn't, God didn't make Eve out of, over Adam's head or out of his head to be over his head. Didn't make him out of her that make her out of his feet to be under his feet in his doormat he made her out of his side so that she would be at his side completing him and when you get into the Hebrew meaning it is beautiful it is the, the position of the wife to complete her husband and that's done when the husband is loving the wife and they're working together as one in that joint union that they are you have the beautiful picture, and that's what we're being told here. Rivka would be a woman of strength and ambition, and it would complement Yitzhak, who we see in scripture very quiet and very passive. 
Remember when Abraham was going to offer up Yitzhak, he willingly laid down his life. He's not the fighter. He's not the arguer. He's not the one that catches the lion and shreds the lion. He's not the one that takes the rock and brings down the giant. He's quiet, he's steadfast, he's steady. He's a beautiful picture of our, our Lord in many, many ways. The comparisons are amazing. But he, and even in that, when Yeshua went to the cross, did he not go quietly and passively? You know, at any split second, he could have said, I've had enough. I'll zap you. I'll give you what you deserve. What about when he's on the cross dying and they're railing at him? You said you could save yourself. You know, save yourself. Come down off the cross. Prove who you are. They had to take a God in his love to not say, oh, yeah. Well, I will show you, because I think any of us in our human flesh would have wanted to take the, the mouths out at that point. So we have a beautiful, beautiful picture here. Well, let me summarize it for us and, and kind of add the I's, dot the I's across the T's. Rebecca, uh, being the wife, being the bride, being the uh, yeah, bride of the bridegroom, she is a picture of the Christian believer. We are the bride of Messiah. Her marriage was planned long before she knew about it. We just read that. It got planned. The servant got sent out. God had it planned all along. Because how could that servant pray that prayer? Who, who put the thoughts in the servant's mind? God. And then who caused Rivka to say, I'll water your camels too. And then do it. And, of course, are being born in the right line. So she was the right family person, all of that. But let's look at the other side. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4, where we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Yeshua Ham Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Messiah, just as he chose us when? In him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. And then it goes on in love, how he predestined us. Did you catch that? When were we planned? Before he even created the world. Now, if the Jewish calendar is accurate, we're at almost 6,000 years of mankind. We know that the calendar isn't exacting, but it's close enough that I'm going to say in round figures, and when you're talking thousands, I think you can round off a few years, we're at 6,000 years of man. God had created the foundations of the world before he put man in the garden. And in fact, because we looked at Genesis 2 telling us that how God really refurbished the world because they can come under his condemnation, the foundations of the world were made sometime in eternity past. How long ago was this all planned? Blows my mind. It could have been thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It goes beyond our concept of time. We were, we were chosen, planned long before. She was necessary, the bride was necessary for the accomplishment and the completion of God's purpose. God had a plan. This wasn't just happenstance. Go down a little further in chapter 1 of Ephesians to verses 22 and 23. It says that he, God, put all things in subjection under, he, under his, Yeshua, Jesus' feet, made him head over all things to the church, to the called out assembly which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we say it, the head of the, the called out assembly, the head of the church is Messiah. Who's his body? His body is made up of the believers in the called out assembly. That's who we are. Are we not then made to accomplish his, complete his plan? Yes, that's exactly what's going on. The same way God made Eve out of Adam, completer, accomplished with him, the perfect plan. She was to share the glory of the Son, and I love that we get to share his glory. Yochanan, John, chapter 17. John 17. And we will look at verse 22 and 23. That's verses, if you didn't hear that right. 
Yochanan John chapter 17 verses 22 and 23. Yeshua is speaking. The glory which you, God, have given me, Yeshua, I also have given to them, so that they may be one, just as we are one, in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so the world may know that you sent me, and you loved them, just as you loved me. So who is Messiah talking to? He's talking to his Talmud. He's talking to those who are followers of him, and he's saying, the glory that the Father gave me, so that the two of us are one in the same glory, that glory I'm giving to those who are following me. I'm giving to the believers, so that what I, I have as the Son in the Father, they have as followers in me, which makes them one in the Father, which makes us all share in the Shekinah glory of our God. We are all one. We are one body, the body of Yeshua, and in Him, then we also are in uh, the Father, as He is saying, because we can't be in one without being in the other, because the two really are one. So we get to share, actually share. That's amazing. When I think of the Shekhinah glory of God, that's going to shroud us. That's going to be our covering. That's going to be what we bask in, what we move in, what we go in, what we see. I oh, wow. Oh, that, that just makes my mind explode. If you don't understand, go look at the tabernacle in Scripture. Look at the Shekhinah glory in the tabernacle. Then look at the Shekhinah glory in the temple, the permanent tabernacle on earth. Then go to Revelation and look at the, the new temple, the, the millennial set up, and take that also with Ezekiel, where the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Tie that into Yeshai, Isaiah's vision in chapter 6. He said, I saw the Shekhinah glory of the Lord. And even, it just, not even, he says, and that his train filled the glory of the temple. That huge temple was filled. Do you know what the train is? It's not a choo-choo going down the track. That train is like a bridal gown, the part that, that carries behind that's on the ground. That's called her train, the part that, that hits the ground and it drags behind. Just that part of our Lord, of our Yeshua, just the train of his robe, Filled the entire temple that Hezekiel tells us about in chapters 40 to 48. Wow, can you imagine if the tail end, and I mean no irreverence to, to the Lord, is that glorious? No wonder we have new bodies. Our eyes would not be able to see. No wonder when Moshe said, God, show me your glory, he said, No man can see my face and live. So he found a way to show something to Moshe. All he showed him was what remains behind. That's what the Hebrew says. God passed by. The glory kept glowing. You ever turned off a light and there's a glow there for a moment? That's what it was. God had passed by. What was left behind? The train. After the train. The little, the, the little residual was enough that Moshe's face shone. And it, 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 it almost blinded the people. They put a cover over his face. Wow. That is what we're being told. We will share in the glory of the Son. Who we? She, the, the wife, learned of the Son through his emissary, through his representative, called her paraclete. Okay? The Holy Spirit, the Ruch HaKodesh, is called our paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the one who is our comforter, as it says in Yochanan in John 16, 13 and 14. Go with me to that now. John 16, uh, 13 and 14. And here we read what the Holy Spirit is like. When He, the Holy Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on the, His own, but whatever He hears, He'll speak. And He will disclose to you what is to come. If He's going to be able to tell us what's coming, who's talking to Him? God the Father, the planner of eternity. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it to you. So the Holy Spirit is going to come to you. He's going to speak truth to you. He's going to speak to you about all that the Father has planned. And of course, Yeshua is in the Father. So the same way that servant told Re Rebecca all the way till she met what Isaac was like, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing with us, on that journey with us, telling us what, what our Messiah, our Savior is like until we are meeting him face to face 
and by that time we are going to know who he is. Not as well as we'll know when it happens, but we're well on our way if we're spending time in his word and in prayer with him. She immediately left all to go to the sun. She loved him before she saw him, and she was rejoicing with unspeakable joy. She's on that journey knowing, I'm a bride. I'm about to be married. Anyone ever seen an unhappy bride? Not if she, she, it's been her choosing. And Rebecca chose, I will go. And so in that sense, she is excited. She's, she's fallen in love with him before she ever saw him. She's got that joy that just continues on. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 8, but keep your finger right there because we're going to look at more than verse 8 in just a moment. But here's the, the joy and, um, unspeakable, the joy that's so great we can't put it into words. Keep up tells it to us. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Thank you. Have you ever seen someone who can say to you, I've seen the Lord. I can describe him to you. And of course, the answer is no. People may have ideas and thoughts and may think that they've had visions. I'm not here to speak against that. But the way I tell you about the Lord is what I learned in the scripture about him. And even that puts me so in love with him. I get so excited. I want to tell you about my best friend. I want to tell you about the one I'm in love with. I want to tell you, when you see this smile on my face, when you see this joy, when you see me wanting to explode like I want to right now because I can't get my words out fast enough to express everything that's inside me, I am like a bride excited over my bridegroom. I am like this one with unspeakable joy. I can't put it into words. Remember when a while back, if you've been with me long enough in class, I was trying to describe God and I was so frustrated and I had told you, I said, I told God I need a new vocabulary. I need bigger and better words. I can't, I, I just can't get it all. And right after that, I was studying in the Word and I, I'll look at what others are saying to get their thoughts that, that the Holy Spirit can use within me, guiding me into truth with the Word of God and to, to understand it fully, just like, you know, if you need to understand something on doctor terms, you talk with a doctor. If you need to understand something archaeologically, you talk to an archaeologist. You know, if you want to talk to someone about shepherding, talk to a shepherd. You get more insight. So I'm looking at it, and of course, my mind's just exploding. I was studying Isaiah 40 at the time. I could still remember. I love that chapter, and I'll be teaching on it soon again. I love every bit of the word of God. But anyway, in that moment, after I'm just saying to God, I, my vocabulary is just too small. In one of my sources, it called God the ineffable God. And I thought, huh, what does ineffable mean? That's what was a new word for me. And so I clicked on the, the dictionary to find out what ineffable means. And I read too big to be expressed in a word or a phrase. And I just exploded all over the, the page, all over, I was alone, thank you, Lord, all over my room. I could not praise him enough. That's you, God. You're too big to put in a phrase. You're too big to put in a few words. I give up. You are just ineffable. And it's been my favorite word since you all know that. So I bring it down. This is the joy. He is our ineffable God. He is bigger and better than any word you want to give me, any word you want to use yourself, uh, you haven't made it yet. So, that's our joy. <laughs> you know, I'm going to pause right here. I just have been, I've been biting my tongue for an hour and a half <laughs> since we started class to burst out with this too. I did not want to steal any joy from Rhonda, but I want to cap on what she shared because when we started this class before we went on, on video, she shared about her brother coming to receive the Lord as his Savior. She thought, the family thought, this was impossible. Ten years of obstinacy and rebellion and no desire in God turned him around in an instant. And he is a new creation. And we all rejoiced and we were all excited. And if you can't see how excited I am when we're teaching you this class today, and the, the fact I love this, I love what I'm teaching, but why I'm ready to explode right at this moment also is this day 
is very important to me in my history. 59 years ago, and now you all know how old I am. <laughs> 59 years ago today, I opened my heart and received Jesus as my Savior. Yay. Hallelujah. <laughs> so for Rhonda to share a new birth on a day I am rejoicing over my birth, I was three and a half years old. I tell people that because do not sell little ones short. I was old enough to know what being naughty meant and what being good meant. And I was old enough to understand when you do naughty things, that's called sin, and you have to ask Jesus to wash away your sin if you want to live in heaven one day. Because I had come home from, my dad had been giving a message at a meeting. My mom had brought me home a little early to put me to bed because I was running a fever. We had done our nighttime prayers, and I told her, I said, Mama, I want to pray. And she thought I said, play. <laughs> and she says, no, you're not well. You need to lay down and go to sleep. And I said, no, no, Mama, I want to pray. Well, she was confused since we had said our nighttime prayers already together. And so she said, what do you want to pray? And I said, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. Oh, in fact, I said the whole sentence. I want to ask Jesus in my heart to wash away my sins so I could go to heaven one day. Well, my mom not wanting to put words in my mouth, not wanting to push anything, you know, because here I am just three and a half. She, she backed up and she just said, well, Rochelle, if that's what you want to do, then do it. And as she told, because I don't remember, but I'm so thankful for a mom who kept telling me the story. I sat up in bed. I bowed my curly little head. I folded my little hands and I said, dear Jesus, please come into my heart and wash away my sin so I can go to heaven someday. Amen. And I lay down and went to sleep. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> I am so privileged to have parents who poured their heritage into me that I could at that young age know and understand and accept. It is simple enough for a child to understand. And I love Dr. David Jeremiah. God put the cookies on the bottom shelf so the little kids could get it. <laughs> and that was me, short and all, I could get the cookies off of the bottom shelf. I have this joy because I have him in my heart. And I will see him face to face one day. And that's what you see exploding all over. When I see this story resembling to us, my beloved coming for me. My beloved right now interceding for me, praying for me, caring for me, watching me, tenderly shepherding me. I feel so loved. I feel so privileged. I am so thankful. And I have this joy, unspeakable, immeasurable, and why I can't put my God into a word or a phrase. And I just have to let it out and ooze it all over you guys. And forgive me for the tears, but they are real. <laughs> and because I'm watching the demo go on, but I just had to let you know, this is a terrific day. <laughs> and then God gave me the special gift this year of getting to teach on my birthday. That's just cherry on top. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I get it all. So, um, okay, so she w was rejoicing. She loved him before she saw him. Oh, I love him. He's glorious. Let me introduce you to him. Nothing compares. Um, she, okay, so she was guided by the servant. And if we look at First Peter here, we see that. Go back to verse 3 in chapter 1. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua Jesus from the dead. That's exactly what I just said. That's what I understood. That's what's happened in my heart. I have that mercy. I have that living hope. I know on the basis of his resurrection. And that's so we can obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven. Rivka's going to her inheritance, but her inheritance is earthly, that we're saved. She's going to go get <coughs> earthly goods with her husband. But when we see the spiritual picture, our inheritance is eternity forever in the presence of our Lord. Never fades, never goes away. The Spirit has revealed that to us, and in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you may 
you have been distressed by various trials. Have I had trials? Yes. Can I tell you it's been 59 years of Disneyland? No. But has my God walked through every up and down and every trial and tribulation and brought me through? Absolutely. Verse 7 says that proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes though tested by fire, it may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Yeshua Jesus. When we see him revealed, praise, glory, and honor, everything here grows dim, and the glory of him, wow. So that verse 8, though you have not seen him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible. I skipped a phrase, sorry, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. Verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. There's your reward. There's your cherry on top. There it is. I've got his joy now. He's helped take me through every trial. And I know my outcome is that the glories of his heavenly home, my abode. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's a beautiful picture. And just as a servant guided Rebecca all the way, he didn't leave her part way, he didn't say, now go the rest of the way on your own, he took her all the way. The Ruch HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, who is our, like engagement ring, as good as marriage in, in that picture in that time, takes us all the way home. So we are brought by the servant to the son. We already read about that in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, that we are caught up. Remember 1 Thessalonians 5, the spirit that's restraining is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit takes us, leaves this earth in that way, takes us home to heaven. Then he will work on the face of the earth as he always has from the beginning. He hovered over the face of the earth in chapter 1, verse 2 of Bereshit of Genesis. We studied it well when we were there. But we all the way, we are with the, the servant till we are in the presence of our bridegroom. And my last point of this is Rebecca was loved by and finally united forever to the Son. And I want you to realize that you are loved by the one who is the bridegroom. You are loved, as we said, when we drew the picture of the church that, that Messiah loved the church so much that he was willing to lay down his life. That's love. That's genuine love. You can read it in, again, verses 26 and 27 of Ephesians 5. Revelation 19, 7. Let's go over there just for a quick moment. I love, I love this. Revelation chapter 19. We have just gotten through the ugliness of, uh, whoops, I didn't put it in right on my tablet, of uh, the tribulation period. We are at the point where the Lord is coming back in his second coming. That's starting in, in chapter 19, it's starting um, right there in the beginning. Heaven's crying out, hallelujah. Um, but then in verse 7, keep reading it. It tells you how we're coming out of heaven with it. it, it but verse 7, my point right now, how loved we are. Let's rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb has come. He's getting his marriage. He's having his marriage. The bride is pre prepared herself. How she prepared herself, I can't talk. By putting on his robe of righteousness, not by her works, but by the work of the one who has done it for her. That's why verse 8 tells us it was given to her, see, given to her, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Everything that we do that is righteous is in his power wearing his robe of righteousness. But that's how loved we are. He's going to clothe us in his robe. And Isaiah 64 tells us also that it is that we are, he's the bridegroom and we are decked in his robe. Um, and in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we read it earlier, that's where it says that we will be with our Lord forever, that we're caught up to be with him forever. So Rebecca is a beautiful picture of the Christian believer of the Messianic believer, the one who believes in Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, for Savior, forgiveness of sin, for our salvation. That makes Yitzhak like Messiah, like the Christ. And let me take you through that quickly because I want to give you the whole picture. So in Genesis 15, 4, 
we have the promise long before he's coming. Let's go ahead and read it real quick, get you on the same page, and then I may just recall your remembrance, and keep in mind, all cross-references are down on those papers for you already. Genesis 15, 4, Then behold, the word of the Lord came to Avram, saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come for your own body will be your heir. Isaac was promised long before he came. We know it's 25 years later before Abraham gets this promise fulfilled. When we read in Micah, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, it tells us that, well, let's read it. Let's just do it. If I try to summarize it, I'll probably take longer. Micah, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. We read, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, that's a specific Bethlehem, the one that's south of Jerusalem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. You were, it was just a little village. Yet from you will come forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So the promised Messiah, the ruler, has been promised to Israel, will come from Bethlehem. This is, he's come, he's ancient of days, but the promise was given 700 years before it was fulfilled. So long before the son came, he was promised. Isaiah 9, 6, and as a child is born, because the child, the flesh, had to be born, the son is given, because the son is who Micah said is from eternity past. So Isaiah 9, 6 tells us again, this son is going to be born in human flesh, and it was again 700 years before it happened. Let's read when it happened. Luke chapter 1, and we'll start with verse 68. Luke 1, 68. We'll just read the first few verses there, or the few following verses. Uh, chapter 1, 68, <coughs> whoops, where we read, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us, accomplished, I'm sorry, redemption for his people, has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. And then it goes on. So the prophets told it in ancient times that finally happened when we're reading it here in Luke, and we know that's in uh, the beginning of what we refer to as A.D., that it was prophesied hundreds of years prior. He finally appears at the appointed time, though. In Genesis 18, 14, Abraham is told Isaac will come at the appointed time. In chapter 21 and verse 2, the, the angel had said that um, Sarah would have Isaac the following year at the appointed time, and that's what happened. So they've been told about Isaac coming for years. Then they get a more close. It says that at the appointed time next year, you will have him. And then how about our Messiah in his appointed time? Yes, Galatians tells us that. Galatians 4 verses, I think it's 4 and 5. Um, go to Galatians chapter 4. And we'll start with 4, and I think we can quit by 5. Yeah, 4 says it right up front. When the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. But it happened in the fullness of time, at God's appointed time. It didn't happen a day early. It didn't happen a month late. It was exactly at the time that God had prophesied it would be, and that set in motion all the rest of the prophecies, even the timing of his death, to be exactly as God had said. Well, Yeshua, we know, was conceived miraculously, virgin born. Luke 1.35 told Miriam, that Mary, that the Spirit of God would have her over her and she would be found with child. It was not <coughs> Yosef, her earthly husband's child. It was of the Holy Spirit. And remember Yitzhak was born to two bodies that were as good as dead. Sarah hadn't had any children. She's going to be 90 years old when she gives birth. What nine-year-old gives birth? One that's been rejuvenated, one who's been given back the ability. And even um, when we read Hebrews later, and I'll come up to that reference in a moment, Abraham, Abraham, was, his body was as good as dead too, counted that way. And yet the, the birth was miraculous. 
this one, Isaac being a picture like Messiah, was given an appropriate name by God before his birth. Remember in Genesis 17, 19, when they're told you're going to have a son, you're going to name him Yitzhak, laughter. God told them what they were going to name their son. They didn't wonder. They didn't spend nine months saying, am I going to have a boy or a girl? And they didn't say, I wonder what we should call him. My niece just went through nine months, even after she knew it was a girl with the trying to, she and her husband trying to come up with a name they could agree on. It was done. You're, you're carrying a boy, or you will carry a boy, and you will call him Isaac. And then when we look at Matthew, Matthew, a book written, and I love the way somebody said it earlier today, and I totally agree, and it's not a new thought, but I love it. Matthew, oh, Rhonda said it. Matthew is a book about a Jew, written by a Jew, to the Jewish people. And in that Jewish giving of the story of his birth, in chapter 1, in verse 21, it says, She will give birth, I'm sorry, she will give birth to a son. You shall name him, and I'm going to do it in the Hebrew because that's where we get the understanding. Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. And Yeshua means God saves. That's why it's Jesus in English, but it's Yeshua in our Hebrew. So he's named before by God. God told them what to name Jesus. Miriam and Yosef didn't wonder over what to name or what she was carrying or how she was she conceived. They knew the same as we see paralleled with Yitzhak and his earthly parents. Now, in Genesis 22, verses 9 and 10, Yitzhak is offered in sacrifice by his father. And in Yohanan, John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the father offering the son in, in sacrifice so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Look at Isaiah 53, verses 4, 5, and 10. I think we've got time to look quickly because I am winding up. When we look at these verses, we see how willingly Yeshua gave up his life, that it was ordained by the Father, but he willingly gave his life, even as we already read in Yochanan and John. In chapter 53 of Yeshaya, Yeshahu, beautiful picture of the sacrificed lamb, we have, surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we, esteemed, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So who did we see um, stri strike him, smite him? The affliction came from God. God was the one who said, my son is to be sacrificed. And the son, of course, willingly went through it. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. He suffered all of that because the Father set in motion, he ordained that the Son be this sacrifice for us. And it, it, the, the Son in complete agreement. Verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. So now we have God the Father pleased to crush the Son, the Son being willing as he is God to go through this, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. If he's willing to go through this death, there is a resurrection. There is a beauty that will come out of it. It does not end in an ugly death. But Yeshua was obedient unto death. Again, Yitzhak willingly laid down his life. He was willing for his father to sacrifice him. And when we read in Philippians 2.8, we read that Yeshua was obedient even unto death, the death on the cross, that he did not fight it. He went along with it. I want to take you to, to Yochanan, John chapter 10. This is the Good Shepherd chapter also. And in chapter 10 and verse 11, we read, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He willingly laid down his life. God the Father did not make God the Son do something God the Son didn't want to do. They together in eternity past made this plan that, that what the Father was saying was put in motion. The Son would be the one carrying it out. The Ruch Kosh is the one that would bring it into us personally. It is amazing. Look at verses 17 and 18. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so they may take it up again. 
No one has taken it from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So the Father not only planned the death, but he planned the resurrection. The Son would have the power to resurrect, to conquer death. And Yitzhak was willing to go along with the Father's plan. Abraham said, I believe even if I slay you, God will raise you. We get that in Hebrews, that that's how he believed and he was right, because he was the son of promise. God had made a promise, so if God was going to kill off the son of promise, God was going to have to resurrect him to continue it on. And Abraham, even though he didn't have scriptures to show him resurrection like that, that we have to look back on, yet Abraham believed it. Hebrews 11. He's in the hall of faith because he had such great faith. Verses 18 and 19 of Hebrews 11. It was he to whom it was said in Yitzhak, your descendants shall be called. Here was the promise. Through Isaac, you'll have the, the descendants that will lead to the seed. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. That's why we use the word typology, because the scripture says right here, Isaac was a type of Yeshua. That's why we call it typology. And in that, Abraham was absolutely assured that he would be raised from the dead, and it was as if he was being brought back from the dead, even though Isaac literally was not, but Yeshua literally was. Genesis 6, I'm sorry, Genesis 26, 4. Let me read that for you real quickly. Whoops. Genesis, I'm trying to hurry because I'm really right at the end, and I don't want to break it and come back and try to, you know, get all this together in our thoughts again. So forgive me for just a couple more minutes. Genesis 26 and verse 4. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and give your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we know that comes through the fulfillment of Messiah that God had promised. Now, he was brought back from the dead, Yeshua. He raised from the dead. And we know he'll be the head of a great nation that will bless all people. And what did it say here? That the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And where do we see that? Let's go all the way to the end. Let's look, let's be the spoiler alert. We're going to the end, but we want to know the end. Revelation 5, 6 through 10 gives us a heavenly scene. If you want to get excited over heaven, read Revelation 5. If you can't read that and don't get excited over wanting to see this, then, then question your salvation. <laughs> Verse 6, I saw between the throne the, with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. Now we know Isaiah 53, the lamb, the suffering lamb of God. This one, the, Yochanan, John seeing it as if he'd been slain. Because remember he's resurrected. It's having seven horns that's talking about power, seven eyes all seeing, seven spirits of God, the, the spirits of God, the spirit of God that goes out. Read it, um, Isaiah 11 to get the seven, um, seven governmental powers, shall I put it that way, of the spirit. I'm having to hurry. Let me just get to the point. Sent out to all the earth. He came, he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he'd taken the book, and that was the, the grant deed to the earth. The four, and the one who takes it and opens it is the one who owns it. So the one who bought back the earth. The one who's redeemed the earth. Okay, that's what we're seeing. He took the book. The four living creatures, the 24 elders who represent us, fell down before the Lamb. Each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are our prayers, the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song. Okay, here we go. Sing. Worthy are you to take the book, to break its seals, for you were slain. Purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe, every time, every people, and every nation. Was Yeshua raised up like Isaac to be the blessing through this nation? All would be blessed. We know through Israel, God promised that the nations would be blessed. We'll see it in its fulfillment in Yeshua. Yes, here we have the perfect picture. And when you start out in chapter 5, Yechanan is crying. No one could be found who could redeem back the earth. And the angel tells him, stop crying. Stop crying. And shows him the one who could. This is 
Isaac in small form, Yeshua in great form, because all the word, the earth through ages will be blessed through the king headship of Messiah, through the nation of Israel in a millennium, when the other nations come up so that there's rain in their land, etc., etc. But what a beautiful picture, and what a good reminder to every Gentile out there. You're just as loved and just as precious, and God made a plan for you to be right there in the midst of the picture. It wasn't just for Israel. It was a conduit through Israel to bless the rest of the world. And my last point in here, in Genesis 24, where we've just read, he's given a bride. Yitzhak is given a bride. We already read in Revelation 19 that the marriage supper has been made for the Lamb, that we've been given a fine linen clothed in pure white to put on because we're, remember Rivka got clothing because she's stepping into the role of a princess. She's in a higher role than she was as we come into our, what we are receiving from our bridegroom. We are given that robe of righteousness too because we're raised to that higher level also. And uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, I've got that. I don't remember. I know it'll come back in a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 tells us, Oh, for I am jealous to you with a godly jealousy. I betrothed you to one husband so that to Messiah I might present you as a pure virgin. Paul speaking to those who, who he's led into salvation. We are those led into salvation. We are the pure virgin bride being brought to our bridegroom. Why pure? Because we're washed in the blood. So in this Genesis account, we have a beautiful picture with Rebecca as a representative of the believer, of Yitzhak representing Yeshua. Now notice this, Genesis 22, verses 13 and 16 are dealing with Yitzhak uh, going through the near sacrifice and being brought back. That was the last time, the last place, uh, let, me, let me say it right, okay? Isaac was last seen at that place of sacrifice. The next time we see him after that place of sacrifice is when he goes out to meet Rebecca. We hear about it in between. Abraham sending the servant to get a bride for him, but we saw Isaac at this place of sacrifice, and now we see him receiving his bride. Do you get the picture? Mm -hmm. During the time that he's not seen, his name is frequently on the lips of Abraham of the father. His lips, his name is frequently on the lips of the servant, our Holy Spirit. And his name is on the lips of the bride, Rebecca. We should have the Lord's name on our lips because we are so looking forward to him and sharing him with others. What a beautiful picture. The one who we have not seen since he was sacrificed, rose from the dead, ascended, the next time we see him is when we're meeting him as pride. I love it. So, final note. Chapter 22, we see the picture of Messiah's crucifixion, the son that's being offered. Chapter 23, we see Sarah represents a picture of Israel, the nation of Israel. We see in her death that Israel's plan is set aside. Chapter 24, we see the picture of the Holy Spirit calling out the bride for the son, that's the called out assembly, the church where we are now, and delivering her to him in rapture. We saw that through this whole picture. Um, and again, I could give you the verses. I've given you 1 Thessalonians 4. Look up also Acts 15, 14. But then chapter 25, what we're going to move into, we're going to see a picture of Israel restored. Abraham is going to marry again. He's going to have a new wife. Now, she's going to produce seed. They're not Jewish. The line that will be called Jewish is going to only come through Isaac. But when we get into the millennial kingdom, where Israel comes into that relationship with her uh, Messiah that, that has been promised to her, it's not for the Jews only. The people who make up the millennium are Jew and Gentile. So the Gentile seed of Abraham is going to receive the blessings along with the Jewish seed. So we see the future kingdom, we see that restoration, um, we see in essence Abraham given the kingdom that he had been promised that through him all the nations would be blessed. 
And when you look at Matthew chapter 22, you can read it on your own. It's a parable, but it talks about the, the coming king and his son, and it is a picture for us of the father and the son. And it's a picture of who goes into that kingdom in the judgment, and you will see that there are those who are Jewish that go in, and there are those who are Gentile who go into the kingdom. What's the criteria to go in the kingdom? They've accepted Yeshua into their hearts. This is after rapture, during the tribulation. Those who got saved will go into the millennial kingdom, both Jew and both Gentile. So they have a total and complete picture in these chapters. Yitzhak and Rebekah are going to continue having sons that lead to sons, that lead to sons, that lead to the Messiah. After the bride's taken home to be in heaven, her new home, then we see Abraham's seed come back into the picture again. We see Israel come back into the plant. God is not through with Israel. And that's where I'll pick it up next week and give you verses that show God didn't replace Israel with the church. God didn't throw away his plan. He didn't change it. God fulfills his plan. So we'll pick up next week with the, the restoration of Israel as we see in picture format here in Genesis, but we'll look at it in the prophecies in Jeremiah, in Isaiah. We'll see um, other places also what is being said for us. It, it's an amazing picture, but I can leave it there. We've, we've got our full picture. So forgive me, I ran over. It's been a great time of sharing. I hope that you've caught the picture. You've got the vision. I love painting a picture because we get so much more out of it. And we used to be able to safely say a picture is worth a thousand words. I know they touch them up now and you can't count on them, but the picture and the word of God, take it to the bank. Dot the I's, cross the T's. What an amazing level. We don't just see Isaac and Rebecca. We see the son and we see the called out assembly. We don't just see Abraham, dad. We see God the father. Is it not a beautiful picture? Is it not rich? I hope it's blessed you as much as it has me. I'm going to close in prayer fast, open the mics for any who want to share comments, questions, and we'll take it from there. But hallelujah. Oh, Lord our God. We are so excited one day to see you face to face. To know that day is drawing closer and closer, let us quickly, Lord, serve you. Be obedient to do what you would have us to do. Allow your spirit to work through us that we might be light shining in the darkness so that we can save others from the coming night, that they too can be sons of the light and go home to be with you in that, that special day of rapture that we believe could happen at any moment in time. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for blessing us, saving us, keeping us, and bringing us home. Thank you that the spirit is with us all the way on the journey till we're delivered home safe and sound forever and ever. Hallelujah. All glory to you, our precious Lord and Savior, Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a class. <laughs> I love it. I love the word of God. Yes, Rowena.